outward appearance can bring to you uh, and do not make your decisions according to what is really going on in the physical realm. But be spiritual. Be spiritual because one picture that you are seeing, it is not the reality of it. Your God is telling you. So if you can only see the physical aspect of things, your reaction might be wrong. And this is the case that God is te telling Samuel, said, Samuel, this young man that you have chosen, I have rejected him. I have refused him. He is not the one that I am looking for. And so interesting. Uh, David is not here. David is not among them. So what does it mean? It means that the father himself had even put that David, despised David. So the, the, the other side of the story is that, oh, people might just see you as, oh, no, 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 this one, we know him. Oh, no, no. We, 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 you, when they meet, they are meeting, considering people that are supposed to be part of the meeting, you're, you are not among them. You will not be called. Your name will not even come there because you are completely rejected by people. Completely rejected by people. How can Jesse, a man who has eight sons, a great prophet of God has come to that house and said that I have a message from Almighty God for your children. Gather all your children for me and the man will forget one of his children. Most likely, you know, most of the time, the last one, we pump us so much, the last one. So how come that David being the last one is the one that, that is rejected? The instinct of parents is that the last one is always trying to be pushed. <laughs> you know, we want the last one to have. And when you are last, you enjoy all the benefits of all day that came before you. But we are facing a situation. The man is keeping the sheep. And the whole family, and none of the brothers even remember that they have a little brother out there to remind the father, Daddy, David is not here. Nobody said such a thing. Could you possibly, you know, see this picture? Can you picture yourself in such a situation? I have good news for you. Maybe you are thinking that <laughs> uh, people have been rejected you, that you are nobody, that nothing good can come from Nazareth. I am telling you, God has chosen you. Almighty God has a mighty plan for you. For you. So if man has no plan for you, the word says that he said, if God be for you, who can be against you? Who, if almighty God has chosen you, let the whole world reject you and refuse you, it doesn't matter. You are still the chosen one. So important. Sometimes we make noise and we get worried for nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because of what people are saying and what people are doing, what we can see in the outward appearance, and we live our lives accordingly, you will crash. You will crash. Because you, you, you are going to make hasty decisions. You are going to make steps in life that you might regret down the road. And let me tell you, People, as far as people are concerned, people can promote you. People are making choices according to their own interest. The time comes that they do not see you as someone that there is any form of interest, benefit from you. The same way that they promoted you, they would definitely depromote you. If man made you a king, they have the ability to dethrone you. But if God put you there. Man cannot dethrone you. I pray for somebody here. Any form of contention over your life that is bringing you down and down, please put yourself together because the report of Almighty God, it is not the report of man in the name of Jesus Christ. So mighty. One must have a clear understanding about life. We don't live for ourselves. We live for the plan of almighty God. David made a statement. Psalm 27. And the verse is 4. He said one thing. Have I desired of the Lord. That I will seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. 
and to inquire in his temple. To behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire, one thing have I desire of the Lord. One thing. Do you know that most of the things that we desire is not of the Lord? We want to behold the beauty of the world. We want to behold the beauty of what we can get from people. You see, the, 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 the fake, the fake acclamation, the fake honor. You know, people are uh, honorable, but there is nothing in you that is honorable. You, God had not said so. It is better to come down and be focused on the right direction, desire of things that can remain, not the fake things of this world. People lifting you, it is all fake. But if they are lifting you because they do not have choice, God had already made you out there. Then to God alone be the glory. Hallelujah. One thing have I desire of the Lord. I will remain at his temple and behold his glory. So in that, one must seek to know God and to serve him. Luke chapter 4 and the verse is 8. He said, Jesus answered and said, he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What is it? This is during the temptation to Christ. When Satan came and tempted Jesus, saying that, he said, Jesus, I know you are great. Jesus, uh, you see, all these things, look at honor. People will honor you. They will worship you. All these things, the worldly things, everything will be for you. Take these things. Just bow before me and take them all. Jesus said, it is written. It is written. So when one has not come to find out what God is saying about you, you are to exchange, you are easily to exchange a glorious destiny that God has written about you with the blink blink of the devil. Jesus was able to say, it is written about me that it is almighty God and him alone shall I serve. Thou shalt worship God and him alone shall thou serve. The order is very important. I have been saying this before. You cannot serve God if you don't worship God. The worship in the worship, your heart is in there. I have found a man after my own heart. A man who will listen to my instruction and do it. Saul was rejected because he will not obey my instruction. David was chosen because humility and despise all the you know afflictions and animosity and rejection and everything else that was coming from his own father and brethren god still chose that man because the lord could see something that is within him that people could not see something that is within him that people could not see maybe your wife is not seeing the quality that is hidden in you and despise you, talk to you anyhow, treat you anyhow. Please, I pray for you that you will not be caught by the, by, 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 by the craftiness of the devil to destroy your marriage. But continue seeking your God and praying for this woman. But at the, at the due time, the appointed time, the Lord will bring forth the gold in you. The God, almighty God, he said, he sees what is in there. What is in there? And that is exactly what is happening. We despise this one. We despise that one because, uh, you know, finances and all that. So uh, they look at you and say, oh, we know that he won't be able to provide anything anyway. So why call him to make any decision? Why call him to make any decision? We thank you. Worship him. So that you can serve him. So now, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 10 to 11, this is what we learn. 
Jesus, Jesse. This is what we have just said. Jesse made the seven of his sons pass before Samuel, right? And then Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord had not chosen any of these ones. And Samuel said unto Jesse, I hear all thy children, Jesse. Are all your children here? Then Jesse said, Oh, I have forgotten. I have forgotten. There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. Saul said unto Jesse, Send and fetch this one. For we will not sit down until he come hither. I have good news for you. When God has chosen you, that they, even they are trying to hide you, they are trying to oppress you, no matter how much they will try, the Lord will still fetch you out. Almighty God will still fetch you out. It's a matter of time and understanding. It looks like your family is not going nowhere. It looks like today you are facing so much difficulties and it seems like there is no way out. The heart that is after God must continue seeking for God, worshiping and serving your God. Your God will fight your battle in the name of Jesus Christ. This is what we are talking about here. It's not just the story about just David and then that's it. These are principles of life. How God functions. What is so important for people, this is not where God is coming from. But that is exactly what people are magnifying in our lives. That if you are not, if you are not having these things, if you are not doing this, then you are not there at all. Neglected and ignorant and despised and just name it. But God had a plan for you. God had a plan for you. And he will bring forth that plan. So, I will not sit down until you bring forth this young man. I will not sit down until you, you bring forth this young man. So, uh, then that is how David was brought forth. Now watch this. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, chapter 17 verse 34 to 35, we read this about David. David himself talking to Saul. This is, please, don't lose track. David is the one that has been chosen to replace Saul. Yeah? Okay. Now, David said unto Saul, because this is the time that when God had already chosen David, nobody knew what was really going on. Samuel knew. But the Israelites were facing huge problem. They had a problem with Goliath. Goliath challenging the nation of Israel. And the army of Israel is diminished to nothing. But the anointed one of God, this little young one, David, was brought in. And David said that, he said, you know, this Goliath that has become a threat upon this nation, I can take him down. And no one will believe it. You know what it means? It means that you, who has been despised all these years, you, that they said that you are nobody, there is nothing will come from you. Something is going to happen to these people that you will be the solution of that thing. And it is only you that God is going to use to bring forth that solution and no one else. And that day, everybody's, you know, prejudgment, everyone's conception, negative conception and despisement upon your life will be removed, not because they want to remove it, but because they have no other choice. They have no other choice. This is the reason why I keep telling people, I said, don't live for people. Live for yourself unto God's glory. Make sure that every decision that you are making, it is okay with you, with your family. And then whatever that people will say, they say, oh, look at them. For the past one week, they have been on the pepper and the tomatoes and sardine. And so what? 
And so what? You are still alive. God keeps you going. A time is coming. Matter of fact, the rich people, that's what they read. The rich people, that is what they eat. Do you know that more you have? You know, go, go and see. The poor ones, they want rich food. But everybody knows that rich food, that is what is going to take you early grave. Early grave. We want to see, you know, we, the type of soup that they will make. And if they don't see the oil on top of it, they say, oh, poor woman, you don't know how to cook. But go see the rich man. He knows he wants to enjoy his riches. He wants to live and live longer. He eats well. He eats well. He eats well. Amen. Hallelujah. This is all part of the Bible. Oh, to God alone be the glory. Mm. So now, uh, David started explaining to Saul that he can take this Goliath down. You can take Goliath down. You, who is nobody in this family. Are you the one that is going to provide solution for this family? And you stand out there and say, yes, I can do that. And matter of fact, I'm going to explain to you the reason why I can do this. Do you know that the time that all of you, all of you, my father, my mother, my brethren, when all of you were just stamping me to my grave, when you were despising me, when you were not considering me as somebody, do you know God was working on me? Almighty God was preparing me. The Lord was just getting everything together so that this moment will come and for me to be that solution that you are looking for. So he explained himself. He said, King Saul, me thy servant, I kept my father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock so he said, Cain, I just want to explain myself a little bit. Allow me to do so. I used to keep my father's sheep. And uh, a lion came and a bear one day. And they took one of the sheep, one of the lamb. He said, Cain, listen to what I did. I went out after that lion. And smote the lion and deliver it out of his mouth, the lamb that he took, or the sheep. And when the lion arose against me, I caught him by the beer and smote him and slew him. Hallelujah. He said, <laughs> This situation looks like impossibility. But let me tell you the reason why this could be possible. And let me tell you the preparation that God has made in me. My father had sheep and I was the one keeping them. A lion and a bear. A lion showed up, took one of the sheep. He said, I went after that lion. And took the sheep out of his mouth. And when the lion saw. He had only one thing in mind, that I may also become food unto him. He came after me, I rose up also against him. I cheered the lion apart and killed the lion. And killed the lion. So this Goliath, <laughs> he will be like the lion that I killed. I will go there and I will kill that lion. You know, one must be thinking that, ah, what is going on? Is David boasting of... Uh, no, no. The man, okay, let me back up. A lion, man, no matter how strong you are, you can't kill a lion. We remember one man in the Bible who used to kill lion, Samson. But the word of God says that it is God that was killing the lion. The spirit of God will come upon this man and this man will not be himself anymore and he was able to tear the lions apart. So from that story, we could see that the strength that David got to kill that lion was definitely from Almighty God. This young man has been faithful to God and the Spirit of God is working in him. 
The Spirit of God has been working in him. So David was saying that, you know what? <laughs> there is something about me that you guys do not know. It's not by my might. It's not by my strength. But the Spirit of Almighty God. The Spirit of Almighty God. I am going to solve this situation and all of you will be free in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what he's going to do. My goodness. To God alone be the glory. So, from such a story, you can see the man that the Lord God calls. God is calling honest people. Because you can see, they having a sheep, many of them, lion coming to take one of the sheep, and you putting your life in line. After all, he could have just said that, he said, oh, this is just the sheep. I thank God that my life is spared. Hey, remaining sheep, let's go home. He didn't do that. He looked at the situation, he said, you know what? I am going after that sheep. I will get the sheep and the lion that have hold of the sheep, I will definitely kill that lion. Probably the enemy have showed up in your family. Probably Satan in his craftiness had showed up in your family and has taken something precious out of your hand. You are looking into the situation and you, just, you are just saying, you are still pondering, thinking, he said, am I going to you know, jeopardize my life? Maybe you are broken today. But the type of people that God is looking for are the ones that will stand and look at the situation and say that I might not have strength to do so, but the grace of the living God is definitely sufficient for me in this situation. I will go after you. I will redeem my children. I will redeem my finances. I will redeem my dignity. I will redeem my honor. I will redeem my strength. I will redeem anything that the enemy has taken away from me. And I will go after the enemy himself. And I will stand and destroy him in the name of Jesus Christ. The willingness to engage is very important. We said it, that God calls you. Almighty God, you will not know until you take the step and the great faith in God. You will not know how much potential and how much strength and how much ability and how capable you are until you make the inner decision, a man after my own heart, a man that will make the decision bringing me into the picture because he knows that I am the one who is going to do it. If you are here and you are broken, please put yourself together. If you are here and you are despised by any form of situation, please put yourself together. But I have only one advice for you. Take your strength, draw your strength from the throne room of the living God, that almighty God. You know, Hebrews 4, 16, he said, Therefore, let us boldly come before the throne of God that we may obtain what? Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What you need is that grace. Come before the throne of Almighty God. Whatever that had happened, God will forgive you. The Lord will renew your inner strength and he will implant in you his mighty grace and you will overcome that situation and everyone shall see that this is not your strength but it is unto glory of almighty God. To God alone be the glory in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you and bless you and bless you. Good from the Lord today that is titled How to Recover from Knockdown. How to recover from knocked down. Amen. It is one thing, one thing to go through time of trials. It is another thing to recover from difficult times. Especially an event that we have gone through. Uh, 
could, lo it could lose a loved one, uh, some kind of drama situation might just happen. You might probably lose your job. Something really drastic happen to you. And uh, we know many struggle to come out. Many don't come out at all. They are submerged in the problem and they end up being problem to themselves. Uh -huh. It is not God's will because in the book of John 16.33, the Lord talks about, he said, I'm saying these things to you so that when it happens, you will know that I told you before it came to pass. Say, so in me, you will have peace. But in the world, ye shall have tribulation. Tribulation. So, children of God are not exempt from tribulations. You will be going through tough times. The Lord will help you to overcome it, for sure. But restoration, recovering, coming back, to be yourself is what we are going to talk about today. When the situation had happened, whatever that you have to do as a child of God, you have to do it. But once it's done, then how to recover your life again? Let me give you a clear example. Let's say you lost a loved one. You lost a mother, you lost a child, you lost your husband, you lost your wife. In the process of everything, you have to have your eyes open and be strengthened by the Lord to see every single step that must be taking place during burial and this and that. You have to be strong and go through it. But once the person is buried, once it is over, once everyone is saying that this one is dead, gone. For you, it is not the same because this is the beginning of your struggles. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. How to recover from knocked down. We're going to take the, an example from uh, our dear brother David. In 1 Samuel, chapter 30, the story runs from verse 1 all the way down. So I'm going to read from 1 to 2. David had a problem. And it could be any one of us who has a problem. And the problem that David had is this one. It says, it came to pass, when David and his men, his soldiers, were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekite had invaded the south. They have invaded the south. And Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. Not only they burned, they burned it, but also in verse 2, we are learning that they had taking the women captives that were there in the city. They slew not any, but they took them captives. Neither great or small, but carried them away. So, everyone that was in the city, children as grown-ups, the Amalekites took them away in, into captivity. So, David and his men, they came to the city. And behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captives. This is it. This was David's problem. David was a man in God's will. And matter of fact, 
The reason why he was not there when this happened in the city, it was because the Lord had sent him in Aaron to go on assignment with his soldiers. So in their absence, that is when the Amalekites came, burned Ziklag and took everyone, David's people, into captivity, taking them away. Your problem must be something else. This wonderful husband of yours that you vow to live your entire life with suddenly is gone and had left you alone. And this man who has been the breadwinner of the family, the one who was so strong in whom you were building your confidence and your life partner suddenly, you found yourself without this man around you, this woman around you, your son, your daughter, whatever that the situation may be. Maybe I can give you another example. Maybe you are advanced in age and close to retirement. Something happened and you lost your job without being, having access, without having access to your retirement. And now you wonder how you are going to live your life. All these years, for the past 65 years of your life, you have been working towards this retirement. And suddenly, something had happened. You are old now. The, Lord, the job that you lost, it's not like you can just go out there and recover these things easily. So you look onto the horizon and you wonder how to take things from here. This is just a few examples that I have. You might have your own situations. But this is David's problem. David, in the perfect will of Almighty God for his life, doing God's will, coming back to find out that this is what had happened in his home when he has been sent to go and fight out there. Why the Lord did not tell him, David, stay here. Amalekites are coming. Face them with your men because they are coming after your life. The Lord let him go. God allowed it and this happened. You know, it is simply meaning that can you possibly be in God's will and go through such a situation? The answer is yes. The answer, yes. And be in the perfect will of Almighty God and the situation will overtake you. You'll be wondering if your faith, if this God that you serve is still on that throne. But today I'm telling you that the Lord is still on that throne even when we go through this type of situations. He's still on the throne. He is. So they are in captivity. So, 1 Samuel 34 to 8. What is going to be David's reaction towards the problem? It says, Then David and the people that were with him, they lifted up their voices and wept. They lifted up their voices and what? And wept. Wept is the past tense of weeping. So they cried and cried and cried and cried. They wept. They wept until they had no more power to what? To weep. You could imagine. When the thing happened, sometimes you can't even cry. The situation is overwhelming. You just have to open your eyes and make sure that things are in place. Put things. But afterwards, it will catch you up. In that closet, when you lock the door, then you'll be broken in tears. And you'll be weeping. The good times that you have with them, keep remembering them. And that will incite the weeping. And you will continue weeping and weeping. You will weep until this body is weak. That you have no power 
to weep anymore. So, after the physical weeping had stopped because the body cannot continue anymore, then the inward one, the spiritual one will start. That is the most dangerous. That is the most dangerous one. So they weep and weep and weep and weep until they have no more power to weep. And David, verse 5 of First Samuel 30, he said, And David's two wives were taken captives. They didn't even leave one behind to comfort David. All the two of them were taken. Ahinoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Verse 6, he said, And David was greatly distressed. He was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, and every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Hallelujah. We're going to go slow. You see, the problem was not just David alone. The problem was that David's soldiers also, their people has been taken. Their wives, sons and daughters, they are all have gone. These are the ones that followed David. They followed David. And now, look at what had come upon them. They have lost everything. The loved ones. The loved ones that they are fighting for their lives. These are the ones that they have lost. So, they turned against David. What is it that have turned against you? What is it that have turned against you? You see, after the problem, what is the burden that has been released? Because maybe now you are coming to find out that this man, your husband that you just lost, was full of debt. And the creditors are calling you for you to come and pay. Because they said if there was a life insurance, you were the one that was going to inherit it. Unfortunately, this man did not put any life insurance. Rather, he put debts. You didn't know how he was taking care of the family. He was trying as much as possible. But the man was full of debts. It could be anything else. So after the first problem that you are reaping, now you are coming to find out that there are chains of problems. Like you are sinking deeper and deeper. They turned against David because they have lost their loved ones. But we, turn, we thank God because David, instead of facing them, what he did is this. The word says that, but the end of verse 6 of 1 Samuel 30, it says, but David Encourage himself in the Lord his God. You need that courage. Hallelujah. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. When everything has turned around, you know, against you, or when, when everything around you have turned against you, and you have nowhere to turn, because everything is, uh, is, is against you, you have to be encouraged. In this situation, man cannot encourage you. There is no word from a man's mouth that can give you that encouragement. Because you have to be physically healed and spiritually also healed. Encouraged physically and spiritually being encouraged. David said, I have a God. I have to turn to that God. So David is going to turn to his God. That's what he did. We said, we are talking about how to recover from knockdown. From knockdown. David turned to God. 
So now, 1 Samuel 30, verse 7 to 8. Let's see David's reaction once he turned to Almighty God. He said, David said unto Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son. He said, Abiathar, I pray thee, bring me hither the effort. And Abiathar brought hither the effort to David. So the effort was like the point of contact. Remember, David is a man of Old Testament. David is in good position because David is a king. He's a king. Abiathar is a prophet of God. He's a priest. Stand at the altar of the Lord. That says the Lord. That's it. He said, bring me what I will use to contact God. Hallelujah. Today you don't need that effort because the effort, the real one has been given. Hallelujah. And that one dwells in you. When David has to wear it, you have that Holy Ghost, tabernacle, within you. <laughs> Abiata, bring, bring that to me. And he brought it unto David. And David, verse 8, David inquired at the Lord. So David went before Almighty God, saying, God, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him, David, my son, pursue them, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, recover all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. This is the time when you turn to God. Amen. Release it all unto Almighty God. Father, what shall I do? What must I do? Lord, this situation, it is overwhelming. If I go, will I be successful? How are my children going to be taken care of? How am I coming out of this whole situation? Lord, where, where is the way out? How can I be comforted? How can I recover my strength? How can I stand again? How and how and how and how? But don't worry because he's the God of the know-how. Know, he is the know-how God. He has answer to every problem. He has solution to every single situation. That is the God that you are bringing forth. How, 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 how? He said, my son, be at peace. Be at peace. Go after them. You will recover. Not only you are going, you are also going to overtake them. And you are going to recover all that you have lost. Take in and recover. So now, David did exactly what the Lord say, said he should do. So in 1 Samuel 30, verse 18 to 19, it says, David, and with his men, he went after the Amalekites, and David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them. Neither small nor great. Neither son nor daughters. Neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. He recovered what? All. all. You cannot put your trust in the Lord and be deceived. Most of the time it's a matter of time. When the situation is too hot, it's, it's overwhelming. But once you learn to be comforted by the Lord, and the Lord is going to now take you from one degree of glory to another, and you shall see that there is joy in life. Joy in life. It is only God. You know, when it, 
things happen. They said, oh, God is the one he knows. He's the one that takes and he's the one that gives and take. Give and take. Those words might not set you on the path of heights. You have to be comforted and you have to be able to move on and excel. Because over here, not the only David had recovered what they took, but also the Bible is talking about David bringing spoils. Did you see that? Yes. It said in verse 19, he said there was nothing lacking to them. Meaning that everything that they took from them, they recovered them all. Meaning neither small, so not the children, not their sons, not their daughters, neither spoil. Neither spoil. So they even came back with what? With spoil. Which means, in order for you to have a spoil, you have to go to war and overcome your enemy and take the possession of your enemy. So the one that came after David's life, David had gone, overtaken them, and recovered what they took, and also taken what they had. He's coming back with spoils. Your latter end shall be greater than your beginning. Situations that you are going through will push you to a higher height. God can use anything. Anything. So as far as you are still alive, We love them so much. One day, I asked a question in the Bible studies. And our sister that had uh, the testimony, today is their sixth anniversary of their marriage. So I asked the question, I said, uh, let's say you love your loved one so much. And then for some reason, this dear husband went to hospital. And they have detected a problem with the heart and they said mm, not the kidney because the kidney is true but the heart so uh, the doctor said uh, oh it is you the wife's heart that can match your husband's heart in surgery so they want you to volunteer they are not forcing you. They said volunteer to give your heart so that your husband will live. So what would you do? What is it that you will do? And the woman said, okay, well, I will go and ask my husband first. Then he went, she went and asked the husband that this is the question that pastor asked. So, if it was you, what will you do? The man told the wife, it's an idea, I love you. And I love you very much. But if such a thing is happening to you, and you have gone to the hospital, and they said they need a heart, it means God is calling you first. Go, and I will join you there. <laughs> Amen? As much as we love them, we have to what? Learn to be restored and move on in life. Move on in life. Say, God is calling you first. So today, from what we are hearing, we have to see the process of recovering. So that the enemy will not use this to also bury your life alive. We have a lot of them, they are living and the result of what happened to them, the loss of a loved one, they are not able to come out. They are alive, but there is no glory of God. God is not taking any glory from their lives because they are broken. Broken by the situation. A clear understanding of what life is all about is very, very important. So once you have gone through such a situation, something like that happened to you. 
don't be confused even though you are confused but remain in God's will remain in what God's will how Psalm 55 and the verses 22 Psalm 55 verse 22 it says cast thy burden upon the Lord cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee he shall sustain thee he shall never suffer thee he says he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved the Lord shall sustain you and he will never suffer you the righteous to be moved amen it is the casting of your burden onto the Lord that is the most difficult because that one is manward part the Lord sustaining your life and not suffering you to be moved that is God's part it's not difficult for God to do so but for you to be able to cast your burdens onto the Lord that's where the difficulty is coming from. One has to learn to do that. Release it into the hand of Almighty God. Watch this. In Isaiah 12, and the verse is 2 to 3, it says, Behold, God is my salvation. God is what? Is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. He also is become my salvation. These are not verses that we remember them only in time of difficulties. In time of joy, remember these verses. So that you do not lose track. We are not called to put our faith in people. We are called to see God as the ultimate reason of life. Ultimate reason of life. This is definitely going to help you in the process of recovery. It will help you. The Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He had become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. With joy shall ye draw water out of the well of salvation. I have to keep living. Drawing water to sustain my life. Keeping me going. Every, you know, it is not without difficulties. This moment that you are calling upon the Lord and you are putting your trust and everything, releasing everything, laying on, you know, on the Lord, these are difficult times. It is tough, but you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to learn to go through difficult days, but releasing every single thing that comes onto the head of the living God, casting the burdens. Creditors will be calling you. Children's school fees are yet to be paid. Now you are without it. Some of the traditions where we come from, the woman must even be destitute of what the man had left as inheritance and send that woman away with the kids. For one so-called uncle, useless in life, to come and inherit your sweat. And that woman is just the one that you have been working so hard with. Living her life in great sorrow. And she doesn't know where to start from. The Lord said, start from me. Set your eyes on me. Cast your burdens on me. Every single day, when you are down, see my salvation. For I, the Lord, shall be your strength. And I will surely save you and your children. Now, 
Number two thing that you have to do in the process of recovery, we said number one, you have to remain in God's will. Number two, you have to learn to ask God for wisdom and light concerning the way forward. You have to learn to ask God how to go from here. Job 12 and the verses 13, it says, With God is wisdom and strength. With God is wisdom and strength. He had counsel and understanding. So, this is very important. You know, wisdom is not from nowhere. It is from the Lord. Strength cannot come from nowhere. It's only from God. Counsel that would make you stand in life is not coming from nowhere. It's from the Lord. And understanding that will make you take the right way is not coming from nowhere, but from the Lord. From the Lord. So you have to learn to go before the Lord and be looking for counsel taking strength in the Lord, wisdom from the Lord, it will make understanding the pathway for you to run. In Luke 21, and the verse is 15, the Lord said, when you come to me looking for wisdom and counsel and understanding, how do we go before the Lord looking for wisdom, counsel, understanding? It is, this is a time of prayer. This is a time of what? Of prayer. You have to seek God in an unusual way. Pray. Everything that comes on your way, that Philippians 4, 6, and 7 must be your food. Constant written in your heart and mind. It says, be careful for nothing. So at that moment, when creditors are calling, be careful for nothing. At that moment, when you don't know where the mill is coming to feed these kids, the Lord said, be careful for nothing. But in all, all things, meaning that in all lacks, in all lacks, in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That is what the whole process is all about. Everything that comes on your way. At that, that time, all that is coming is negativity. All that is coming is what? It's negativity. But the Lord said, don't worry about them. You make sure that you take notice and you bring them before me. Come and state your case in prayer before me. Lord, there is no food on the table. Lord, the children's school fees. Lord, this one has taken the land. Lord, there is no money. I mean, be sincere and go before Almighty God and talk to your maker. Talk to him. In all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. He said, once you have done that, that is the man word part. In the verse 7 of that Philippians 4, he said, and the peace of God that surpasses understanding. The peace of God that surpasses understanding. It shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. These are the two places that man gets worried. Heart and mind. He said that peace, it surpasses man's understanding. Let me tell you, at that moment, everybody knows that you just lost that husband, that wife, that your life is in shambles, your life is crippled, your life is just buried. They know. But what they don't know is that in that prayer room, you keep calling upon the name of the living God. Calling upon his name. So when you come out, when they are, they are expecting you 
to be walking, you know, head down and sorrow and all that. I look at you. You are standing and walking. Walking in wisdom. For the Lord is releasing wisdom, wisdom from that prayer room. Walking in the counsel of the Lord. My daughter, go here. Put this one here. Understanding. My son, this one. That one. It goes this way. And you are putting things together. Day by day. Gradually. Say, so be careful. It's not, it's, not, it's not a time of worries. Be careful. For nothing meaning that don't worry about anything. Because worry is a satanic weapon. Worry will not allow you to think. It's a satanic weapon to block the wisdom of God, the counsel of God, the strength of God, the, you know, and, and, and also the understanding of God. That worry, it is meant to take away these things that are going to be your new foundation to build you up. The Lord said, you should not allow worries to take over that situation. So God said, Luke 21 verse 15 that we were talking about, he says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to to can say no resist. That is prayer room. That is what prayer room. This is what we were talking about. It is the Lord Spirit that is going to give you the prayer point. It's the Holy Ghost that will lead you to the prayers according to the it is written of Almighty God concerning your life. The Lord has a plan. And he has a plan for our lives before we get here. So he knows of everything that is going to happen to us in everywhere we go, in anything that we do. The Lord knows. That is a fact. But when one has come to, you know, uh, establish that, that, that foundation in his life, ah, he moves and he stands at all situations. Because all that he sees is Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think of you. Thought of what? Peace and not evil. To bring you to the expected end. So the man is only seeing one thing. It's what the Lord has said that he's going to make of him. He's only thinking of the expected end. Expected end. Expect. You are not there yet. You have no even idea of that expected end. But God is expecting that end. So it is up to you, that is called faith, to put your trust in the Lord, for the Lord to get you to that expected end. Faith. Keep going with the Lord. I will give you a mouth, and you shall speak from that prayer room. He said, your enemies, they will not be able to resist it. They will not be able to what? To resist it. Do you know that when you are going through situations, we have people that would stand there and say, uh -huh. we have gotten her. They take joy in people's sorrow. We have people like that. He said, your enemies, you will subdue them from that prayer room. When they are thinking that your life is over, ah, they see you and they think, they say, oh, that was the former. But they don't know that there is another current one ahead. Mm. So in Proverbs 19, and the verses 20 to 21, you continue praying as the Lord gives you utterance in that prayer room. It says, Hear counsel and receive instruction. That thou mayest be wise in thy letter end. Hallelujah. Do you, you, you can now tell, right? You can see that God has a, such an amazing plan for your life. It is coming out of the Lord's counsel. That is why in, in such a time like this one, 
learn to isolate yourself in prayer room and pray. Because God is going to speak counsel and give instruction for your life to come. He said that thou mayest be wise in thy later end. So where the Lord is taking you, it will take the counsel, the understanding, the knowledge, and all that the Lord must speak to you from that prayer room and show you the way so that you will get to that expected end. He will take you there. That is why he's leading you in with his counsel. People go through situations and they depart from the Lord. You are only going to bury yourself. You go through situations and say, oh, the church is not helping me anymore. The church is not called to help. Christ is called to help. Christ is called to help. So you... You need to know certain things for your future. Verse 21 of Proverbs 19, he said, the reason is because there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. If it is you alone to move on from this situation, this is the time that you're going to be sitting down doing calculations and God said, my son, my daughter, seek my way. Come find out because your life is already in my power. I have a blueprint, a blueprint of your steps, your footsteps in every single day. Come around. Let me show you. I will guide you there. So your own way of, let me do this, let me put the one, he said, Many are the devices in a man's heart, but only the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. Many that did not seek for the counsel of the Lord, they go from one problem to another. One problem to another. Because if you are not careful, this is a time where you are very vulnerable, you are very weak because of what you, you have been going through. But in the wickedness of man's heart, some will take advantage of you. Some will take advantage of you. We have seen people moving around looking for widows to marry. We have. And they, make them, they, they, they come around to make you double widow. Double widow. Some, they come around to marry you. So if you are not careful, you'll be moving from one problem to another. You keep sinking. That is the devices in the, in the man's heart. What you think is the right thing to do. Don't think is the right thing to do. Be certain from the counsel of the living God. He said, he shall, you shall receive instruction from that prayer room. You shall receive instruction. And the Lord is still talking about enemies upon everything that you are going through. He's still talking about your enemies. So they are still around. counsel of the Lord that shall stand. So as you are moving with the Lord, you have to determine to resist every opposition and go according to the direction of Almighty God. The book of James, James chapter 4, James 4 verse 7 and 8, it says, under such a circumstance, one thing that a child of God must do, you must submit yourself, yourselves before God. Submit yourself therefore to God and resist the devil. Resist the devil. You have to learn to resist the devil. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is what? Is death. It might look like everything, oh, he's going to help me. He's not going to help you. He's going to help you to be buried. Resist the devil. Oh, now that I'm left with these children, if I marry him, he will help. He's not going to help me. He's not. One must learn to take the right decision. Sometimes you have to be alone. 
When you are tempted to go find another man and get yourself, uh, you know, so that you have someone, sometimes it is better to be alone for a while until the Lord has brought the one that shall be continuation life partner. Continuation what? Life partner. Otherwise, it's, you get worse. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and the Lord will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is a time you want to see the mighty hand of the Lord that is going to take you to that latter end which shall be greater than anything that you have gone through, please do not entertain sin. Do not entertain any form of what? Sin under no condition. Let your mind be singled, focused on Almighty God. Anything, the only one that can help you here is God and no one else. And you do not want to take any type of action to offend your God. Your enemy will bury you if you do so. Absolutely. This is the word of God, not the word of man. These are kingdom principles. This is how heaven works. You want to see the mighty hand of God upon your life and to see you coming out of difficult times and standing on your feet to a higher height. Then the Lord said, Sin must not be something that you should entertain. Purify yourself. Purify your heart. Double-minded. No more. Set your eyes upon the Lord. If you do so, you know what the Lord is going to do. Deuteronomy 12 and the verse is 7. Deuteronomy 12 and the verse is 7. The Lord said, once you have walked in these principles of life, ye shall eat therefore, he said, ye shall eat before the Lord your God. Ye shall eat. You cannot eat if you don't have. So the Lord shall provide. Ye shall eat before the Lord and ye shall rejoice in all that you have put your hand unto. Ye shall rejoice in all that ye shall put your hands unto. You see, it doesn't matter anymore. If the counsel is of the Lord, if the leading is of the Lord, that little that your hand will touch, heavenly multiplication will come upon it. Heaven multiplication. Whatsoever that your hand will touch, the Lord shall what? Shall flourish it. It is good to have God on your side. Because from here, the cancel, oh, if I do this, this is what will work. The Lord said, it does not matter. What matter is for you to seek me. I will show you and I will bless you. When I bless you, whatever that your hand will touch, I, the Lord, will touch it. He said, whatever that your hand will, what, will touch, I, the Lord, will, what, will touch it. He will touch it. When the Lord touches anything, that thing shall never be the same. That thing shall never be the same. Businesses that people are doing that is not working. You go there, you touch that business. It's like heaven opens. Heaven opens. You shall eat before the Lord. And ye shall rejoice in all that your hand will touch. Ye and your household. Okay? Not just you. We, we said it. Provision shall be available unto the children. Wherein the Lord thy God had blessed thee. This is coming from the blessings of the Lord. These things, they are coming from what? From the blessings of the Lord. It's amazing. So, whatever that comes on our ways, we have to take counsel to recover. To recover. Putting our trust in the Lord. And knowing that our God is with us. 
that no matter how deep this situation has taken you, you are coming out. I said you are coming out. You are coming out. If you follow the process that we have mentioned today, there is no way that you will not come out. David, my son, go. Pursue them. You will recover. You will overtake them and recover them all. You will even come not only what they have taken, but you are also going to come with what they have worked for. That is the blessings of the Lord. They meant it to finish your life. You shall come out in flying colors. And all their eyes shall behold what they don't want to see. For the hand of the Lord has performed wonders upon your life. May the Lord bless somebody here. May the Lord bless someone here in the name of Jesus Christ. Anything that had taken over your life. Today as the word of God has come. Total recovery. Total recovery. May the Lord bless you. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. So we have a word, a word of circumstance because of the Father's Day that we titled Husband and Wife Responsibility. Husband and Wife Responsibility. We are talking about marriage. In our marriages, number one, we have to put God first. God should take the prime position in our marriages. So the book of Psalm, Psalm 127, and the verse is one. The word of God tells us, he said, Except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain that built it. Except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain, in vain that built it. So, you have to understand that your marriage has to come under the umbrella of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your marriage has to come under the leadership of Christ. Then, you can build. Because you cannot build by yourself, except Christ is in, then that marriage shall be sustained. Hallelujah. You know, most of the time, the parents themselves, they have this tendency to forget about themselves. They focus so much on the children. They focus so much on their own parents. So the in-laws, they focus so much on the families around them. And most of the time, they are forgetting about themselves. It is not God's will for you as your husband and as your wife. You should just despise your partner and just be focusing so much on your children or on your, you know, in-laws without taking care of yourselves. If you love, God wants us definitely to love one another. It is not God's will for you to love your children more than you love yourselves as husband and wife. It is so important. It is not God's will for you parents to love your children more than you love each other. Because in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 and the verses 23, 
the word tells us he said husband the husband he is the head of the wife even as christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body so i have said this before the church and our marriages our homes are on the same level we cannot dissociate the church from our homes and you you make sure that what the lord wants you to do in your home you get it done and then you come and fulfill your responsibility in the church god talks about the husband being the head of the wife it is very clear you see the head of the body is so important the head of the body is so important it is giving direction the man has to be able to give direction in your home women are also having their responsibilities but everyone and each one of us god has written in his ordinances for us that this is how he wants to see he wants to see our lives our marriages going you cannot if you take your head or if you are not taking care of the head the whole body is like nothing at all the head is the closest relationship you know you have to you have to imagine the the, the body the physical body and then the physical head how the connect the connection that is between the two you cannot dissociate the head the physical head from the rest of the body the head gives direction the head you know empower the rest of the body to move forth and to be able to do that to do everything that the lord god is you know had brought forth into your life for you to fulfill them it's extremely important as i said if you love your children more than you love yourselves as husband and wife you are going to destroy your marriage you are definitely going to destroy your marriage if you love your parents more than you love your husband or your wife you are also going to destroy your marriage if you love your job more than you love yourselves you are going to destroy your marriage if you love your ministry even your ministry more than you love your wife or your husband you are going to what destroy your ministry putting the lord first as we said it does not mean that you know you bring the things of god over over your your, your marriage relationship no ministry work it is it is not above when we talk about putting god first allowing god to build your home what it means is that the lord god you know the relationship your personal relationship that you have to develop with god the man have to develop that relationship with almighty god the wife have to develop that relationship with almighty god god being the binding glue to bring both of you together that is to build the marriage to establish the marriage but if you are a man of god if you are a woman of god and you are not taking care of your wife and you are saying that oh i am going for lord you know the lord's work i'm going for what lord's work are you talking about god is not asking you to come and do his work you know at the expense of your marriage absolutely not absolutely not you have to be able to take care of your husband of your home before the ministry work comes in so wisdom for everyone and each one of us is to make sure that we are doing what the lord god is calling us to do in the book of genesis genesis chapter 3 and the verse is 6. some men have been so passive and they have just remained passive and their wives have been taken over the house a wife's responsibility is not to take the head of the house you are not to take the head of the house. Genesis 3 and the verse is 6. Remember the commandment that came on Adam and Eve, saying that the tree of the knowledge and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not touch it. Serpent came in there, and what the serpent did, he, he deceived Eve. So the word said that he said when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes 
and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Hmm. This is very, very interesting. The commandment that God gave, it was given to them saying, don't touch this fruit. Don't touch this tree. Don't eat from it. Satan came in and brought forth deception. The woman was caught into it. Pick up the fruit and ate it. And the word says that she gave to Adam and Adam ate. So there is something that is very interesting here because we have always been thinking that by the time that Satan was deceiving Eve, Adam was not around. Adam was definitely around. Adam was just right there. Adam did not say anything. Adam did not say anything and the woman made the decision because the word says that Satan spoke to Eve and Eve, she took of the fruit thereof and she did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. Her husband with her. So Adam was with her. Adam did not do anything. The leadership of the house is not of the woman. God did not give the leadership. This is why we have that much problems over here. The moment that you yield, you yield your house leadership to your wife, something definitely has gone wrong. You are going against, against the, the word of God because God said that you are the head of this family, not your wife. Not your wife. This problem that from here, this problem, it, you know, it dates from this, this particular scripture. From the very beginning, the woman, Satan, you know, by, by, by his craftiness, tried to implement the spirit of disobedience in the woman. This story doesn't just stop here. It continues. It continues because they are firstborn. They are firstborn. Cain. Cain is the one that is going to kill the brother. That spirit of disobedience is being passed on. And you will see that their generations are just the spirit of disobedience. 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 Continuously disobeying the word of the living God. Cain went ahead, disobeyed the commandment of God and killed the brother Abel. Where do you think Cain get, you know, got that thing from? From the mother. From the mother. Because Satan had already implemented that spirit within her. And she's passing it on. How should we build our spiritual houses? As we said, the foundation of that building, it has to be in the perfect love of God for us. One has to come to a point to understand that God loves us. God loves you. No matter what, the Lord loves you. In your marriage, the foundation, before you, you pull up, you know, any, you know you, before you build any building, the first thing you take care of is the foundation. God has to be the builder of that foundation. And that has to be standing on the fact that God loves us. And the Lord's perfect love for you. No matter what, God loves you in that marriage. No matter what you'll be going through, remember the Lord, the foundation where you stand on, the Lord loves you. God's perfect love for you. Whatever that you'll be going through in that marriage, remember God loves you. First and foremost, God's love, his perfect love for you. Marriage is not a worldly institu institution. Marriage, it is God's covenant. God's Almighty God is the one that established marriage. So the Lord God, he said, I hate divorce. He is able to fix any marriage. He is able to fix any situation, any problem that you are going through in your marriage. God is able. So the moment that you remember what foundation you are standing on, you will remember that indeed your God loves you. And no matter what, he is able to turn things around. The second thing that you are building is your own personal relationship with God. As we said it, 
You have to keep your conscience very clear from all sins so that your God can stand for you. You also, the next one is that you have to build a relationship with your husband or with your wife in this marriage. We have people that are married but they don't have relationship. We have people that are married, they, are, they do not have relationship. There is no relationship. Selfish and all self-centered type of attitude. You as a husband, when you go, you pick up your, your little bag and you go to work out there. The woman probably is at home taking care of the children. She has been in that four, you know, four corners of the room the whole day. The whole day that woman has been there. You, you were at work. You said, that, oh, uh, you were doing this, you were doing that. You come home, you are tired. Your wife is telling you, ah, honey, let's just get down a little bit and uh, uh, have a little walk. You are not taking that into consideration. You said that you are tired. You remember you are tired because you have gone to work. The woman also has been at, at, at home taking care of the children the whole day she did not even step out and she's asking you that oh no oh after you have been eating and everything else uh, honey let's just go by the lakeside and have a lot of work and you are complaining i'm so tired you want to sit down in front of the tv that is selfishness selfishness everyone and each one of us have to take other person into consideration you have to have a relationship with your wife it's not now that you are married and then you are taking everything for granted and the marriage is just just going by itself no fire the fire is already gone uh, no uh, uh, you have to come up and build that relationship don't use the children as an excuse do not use your you, you, you know your in-laws as an excuse that this is what i'm doing and i'm doing so much no no but what are you doing for your husband what are you doing for your wife you have to build that relationship with each other and afterwards the next step is that you have to build a relationship with your children you have to build a relationship with your children also and the next and the last one is your relationship in the ministry so you can see that there are hierarchies in how we have to relate in our relationship our responsibilities towards god has to be fulfilled please don't switch things if you are saying that oh my ministry work oh the, the lord's work and you are despising your wife at home you're gonna break your marriage and we have seen so many people that have been broken their marriage that way a husband should be someone that is able to rule his house not giving responsibility to the woman so first timothy chapter 3 and the verses 4 and 5 he said a husband is someone that rule well his own house and having his children in subjection with all gravity for if a man know not how to rule his own house how shall he take care of the church of god so you can see that the house number one and afterwards your ministry if you want to have a position in the church if you want to do god's work please Put your house in order. Put your house in order. How can a man rule the church when he cannot rule his own home? This is not a responsibility to give to your wife that I'm going to church, I have assignment to the church, so you take care of the rest. No. You have a, get yourself organized. Get yourself organized. Ask the Lord to help you. That is one assignment of the husband. Someone who is able to rule his house. A husband must be willing to humble himself before the, the wife and also love her. A husband must be willing to humble himself before the wife and love her. And love her. You think that you are married, so love is not, a, it is not an issue. It is an issue. It is an issue because in marriage, the Lord God, Ephesians chapter 5 and the verse is 25. The Lord said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a commandment. It's a commandment. He calls you husband. So he knows you are already in marriage. And he's saying that you have to love your wife. So you have to make it a point to love your wife. You have to make it a point to, to, to do things that makes this woman happy. You have to make, the, make it a point to be happy together. You have to make it a point to love each other. Husband's responsibility is you loving your wife. Make it a point. What is it that you have to do? 
And you woman too, when we try to love you, don't try to throw us away. Do not try to throw us away because already we are struggling to bring forth what we have inside. And by the time that we come around and say, honey, and honey, and then we're trying to uh, uh, come closer and kiss, this is the time, say, oh, leave me alone, oh, leave me alone. This is not, it's God's commandment for us to love you, so release yourself to be loved. Which means that you men, you have to learn how to love. Which means that you men, you have to learn how to be romantic. Romantic. Be romantic. Change your styles. Bring some new things. Take your wife out. Enjoy her. Just you. That not, not with the children. Both of you alone. Show her love. It is God's will. If you want to be a good father, good husband, this is what the Lord required of you. You see, there is a scripture here. Genesis 24 and the verse is 67. Isaac that time, Isaac is the only child, only child of Sarah. Sarah died and Isaac was just so in, in great grief. She, he mourned and mourned and mourned. The father, Abraham, it is time for me to get a wife for my son. Sent forth his servant to go and bring Rebekah. Rebekah was brought into Isaac. And look at this. He said, when Rebekah was brought, Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent. Into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife. And Isaac loved her. And Isaac loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Hey, let me tell you, when you love your wife, Whatever problem that you are going through, that woman will comfort you in the name of Jesus. When you know how to show appreciation and love to your wife, there is no mountain that will come in that marriage or upon your life that that woman cannot help you to overcome it. In the name of Jesus, it is God's will. It is God's will. God's will. Isaac was comforted. Colossians chapter 3 and the verse is 19. The word says, he said, husband, Love your wives and be not bitter against them. Husband, love your wives and be not bitter. Marriages are based on bitterness. You can only count on the wrong things that the woman is doing. You cannot appreciate that woman. Bitterness, bitterness, it is not of the Lord. You have to learn how to appreciate that woman. You have to start counting the good things that she is doing. You have to know how to give compliments. You have to know how to show that woman great love. Hallelujah. Bitterness. Do not be bitter against your wives. We bless the name of the Lord. That is for you as a husband. Wife, you also have a responsibility in this marriage. You also have a responsibility in the marriage. Ephesians chapter 5 and the verses 22. The Lord said that he said, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is not the time for anybody. You know, you have a responsibility. Submitting yourself unto your husband does not make you stupid. You being the head. What, do you know what it means to be the head? Head means responsibility. Responsibility, leadership, head means that you are the one that is bringing forth that light into the whole family. But your will as a wife, your responsibility is also be submissive. Submitting to one another, that is when, you know, how the whole Ephesians 5 started from. You will not be having problems to submit to each other when truly you are in the Lord. Your husband is not ruling over you. Your husband is giving direction to the whole family. So you as a wife, do not revolt. Don't revolt. Come under the leadership of Christ. As Christ is the head of the church and we are all following him. So you, as a husband, you are coming and picking up the Bible. Let's say in a Christian home. You pick up the Bible and you are showing your wife the scripture. You see what the scripture says. You see what the scripture says. The scripture says that you should be submissive. You should be submissive. That is not your responsibility. 
You as a wife, the same thing. The husband is not doing the right thing. You're picking up the scripture and you're telling your, 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 your husband. You see what the scripture says. The scripture says that you as a husband, you should love me. You should love me. This is not your responsibility. All that God is asking you is that you have to be submissive and you have to love. Hallelujah. Let everybody does his part and let the Lord God take that glory. In this marriage, don't read the scripture to your to you know to one another, but obey the scripture. Do just what the Lord God is asking you to do to bring that glory unto Almighty God. Proverbs chapter 14 and the verses 1. He said, Every wise woman, every wise woman buildeth a house. Every wise woman, if you are wise, you will build your house. If you are wise, you will build your house. If you are a wise woman, you will build your house. But the foolish woman plugged it down with her hands. And we have seen so many women that are, have teared their home apart. A wise one will build it. A foolish woman will just tear that home apart. Hallelujah. So how do you build that house? You build that house with the spirit of submission. You build that house with the spirit of submission. That is how the woman is building that house. Be careful of the spirit of accusation. Husband pointing finger to the wife. Wife pointing finger to, to, to the husband. This is all part of what the enemy did in the garden over there. Genesis chapter 3 and the verses 11 to 13. We are bringing everything to an end. The wife says, he said, God told Adam, he said, who told you? That thou are naked. When the Lord had found them, they have sinned. They are hiding themselves. The Lord is coming. And she, he is telling God, I run away because I am naked. And the Lord said, who told you? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldn't not eat? It was a simple question to Adam. Adam, did you eat the tree? Did you eat from the tree that I asked you not to eat? Listen to Adam's answer. Adam, the man, he said, God, it's not that I ate, but the woman whom thou gavest to be me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. You see, that is a lie. That is a lie. Because Adam was standing just right there. When Satan came, Adam was there. You see that? Adam was there. Adam heard what Satan was saying to the woman. Adam did not say anything. Adam did not have any voice in that house. Adam did not say, tell the wife, Eve, that please don't touch it. God said that we shouldn't touch it. The woman was ruling the house. So Adam did not open his mouth. But he was lying to God and telling God that, hey Lord, it is not me. It is the woman that you gave me. She took and, and, and ate and gave me some. And I also ate. It's not true. Take hold of your, of your home. Be able to rule your home so that you will fulfill what the Lord God has called you to do. To do. So when Adam said it's the woman, the Lord looked at the woman. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is it that thou hast done, Eve? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So pointing at the finger. Nobody is responsible. Nobody is taking any blame. So you, you see, when you have done something that is wrong in a marriage, you have to be able to just say that, I am sorry that it's not going to kill you. It's only going to make your marriage better. Hallelujah. Husband cannot say, I'm sorry. Wife cannot say, I'm sorry. And everybody is bearing grudges and bitterness against each other. That fire is in, how, is in the house because people are not allowing the word of God to flow. The pointing of the finger, always you, always you, always you. But it's never your fault. That is not God's will. When you have made a mistake, mistake, it is something that can happen. God forgives and the Lord God is able to bring both of you together. Recognize your mistakes and each one of you to live unto the glory of the living God. Hallelujah. Don't chase your wife, your, your wife or your husband away. If your husband do not know God and you know God, do not chase this person away. First Peter chapter 3 and the verses 1. The Lord says that he said, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be, be won by the conversation of the wives. In other words, you as a wife, 
Unfortunately, you have a husband that do not know God. And if your husband do not know God, this is not the time to come home and always uh, hammering on your, on, on, on your husband. Uh -huh. And you, this man, that I have known you, you don't even want to serve God. If you are coming to church with me, you wouldn't have even done this. this. God says that this is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to show that man submission, the spirit of submission. Continue submitting. You are the Bible that the man is reading in that house. Why would he follow you to come to the church when you yourself is not doing what the word of God tells you to do. Give him a reason to follow you. It is God's word, God's commandment, God's will for you that if you have associated yourself, your husband or your wife is an unbeliever, you stay with that person. Except if the person is do, asking you to do things that are against the will of God. This is the only time that you can be disobedient. Otherwise, you have to be submissive to that man. And the Lord tells us that as you are being submissive, you become the Bible that the man is reading. One day, God will bring that man into his presence. Proverbs chapter 21 and the verses 19. He says, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Hallelujah. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. A woman, some, you see, the man is not having that peace. God said that if that is the case, it's better for you not even get yourself into marriage at all. Marriage, you have to pray that the Lord bring forth your wife. Hallelujah. Marriage have situations, but you also have to pray that God is able to take care of any situation that will come on your way. If you are a woman and you have become a tiger in that house, if you are a woman and you have become the ruler in that house, you have to stop it. It's against the will of God. If you are a man and you have become a woman, man in your house you have to stop it it is also against the will of god from now onwards the word of the living god tells us that we have to be submissive to each other unto the glory of the living god go home live your lives accordingly and may the lord god alone take the glory in jesus name amen god bless you and bless you every opportunity that we have to come before the lord is expected let me say this again Every opportunity that we get to come before the Lord, we come in great expectation. We come to God in great expectation. We come to God in prayers. So when you are coming for prayer night, you are coming in great expectation. When you are coming for Sunday service, you are coming in great expectation every time that you are coming before the lord you have to come expecting to receive from god you have to come expecting to receive from god whatever situation that you are in when you are coming before god every appearance of your presence before the lord you have to come with expectation so sunday after sunday monday night friday night wednesdays you are coming you come before god don't make your relationship your fellowship with christ a routine don't make your fellowship your relationship with christ a tradition or a religious activity it has to be in expectation. If you are coming, you know why you are coming. If you are coming, you know why you are coming. This is why you drive so long. This is why you are taking time from home. This is why you have requested the Sundays that you will be off. So when you are coming, you come in expectation. Because every time that the Lord comes to his people, he said, what do you need? So if you don't know what your needs are when you come, you might not have answers to these questions. Even though your heavenly father knows what your needs are, he said, still, you have to ask him. So you are coming to ask because you have something in expectation. Very, very important. They are subject to spiritual principles. Someone asked this morning in Sunday school. He said, 
since God had created us, everyone and each one of us, and brought us here in this world, and had predestinated us, why do we have to continue praying and fasting and all, so that the will of God come to pass in our lives? God knows us. He knows what he has planned us to come and do. Why he just don't let things happen the way that he wants them to happen and then all this uh, prayer nights and you know praying and praying and praying and praying and fasting and all that why all these struggles before we get something from the lord and my answer was that you know matthew 7 7 he said you should ask and you'll receive you have to knock and it shall also be what be open you will seek and you will find these are not just words that christ was saying they are kingdom principles kingdom principles we are in this world here as children of god according to christ's prayer in john 17 we are here but we are not from here if we are not from here we cannot be subject to the principles of the world we cannot be subject to the principles of the world we are subject to heavenly principles so how heaven operates that's how we're supposed to operate here and the lord tells you that when you are in need of anything from heaven as far as you are here in this world you have to ask it is not automatic your heavenly father knows what your needs are still you have to ask so the asking part of our lives in the relationship to our fellowship with God is very important and it should not just be when you are in trouble that you come and ask God every time that you come you have to come in great expectation we are going to talk today about how to deal with discouragement how to deal with discouragement because life you cannot we are subject to these things to come there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man so temptations are common to man and as they come your faith is going to be trial and if you fail in the day of adversity, it means that your faith is what? It's weak. You fail in the day of adversity, it means your faith is weak. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, and the verse is seven the word says oh lord thou hast deceived me and i was deceived thou art stronger than i and has prevailed i am in derision daily everyone mocketh me listen to what this man of god is saying what is it that this man is going through to the extent that the statement that this man is making he said oh lord thou has deceived me how can god deceive you what is it that has come upon you that a man will come to a point especially a man of god to make such a statement god you have deceived me and i was deceived you are stronger than i and has prevailed i am in derision daily everyone mocked me when i look around me i have become the object of the amokris everyone is mocking me because of my situation it is very difficult when a man has planned so much 
in his life and something will just come into your life to turn things around and all your plans are completely scattered the loss of a loved one come to lose a wife come to lose a husband come to lose children and the whole life is just scattered the marriage that you vow have come to a point that it is gone now where do you go from here where do you start how do you start in the midst of all this how do you put yourself together this is what we are talking about today how to deal with discouragement event comes in a man's life a man that is born of a woman his life is full of trouble how you handle the troubles how you handle difficult times how you handle a time of adversity this is what we are talking about here how do you deal with people that you have helped so much and now they have turned around and are attacking you he said i have become a mockery they mock me but you see you are the one that gave them stand and today every single thing that you did is turning around against you second case chapter 4 and the verses 1 second case chapter 4 and the verse is 1 the word of god says he said one day the wife of a man from the guild of prophets called out to Eli elisha one day the wife of a man from the guild of prophets called out to elisha and she said your servant my husband is dead man of god you well know what a good man he was devoted to god and now the man to whom he was in debt is on his way to collect by taking my two children as slaves this is a situation here this is a situation that this woman the husband was a prophet and the man died and he died in debt so this widow with the two sons now is facing a situation that the man from whom the husband borrowed is coming to collect by this time he's not collecting any money because they don't have but such as she has so is he coming for he's coming to take the two sons and these two sons are going to be used as slaves as slaves this is the predicament of this woman and she came to the man of god elisha and told elisha man of god this is my situation when you are confronted with situations where that it seems like there is no hope coming from anywhere where you turn to is very important where you turn to to seek for hope or help is very important when you see people moving to idols and fetish priests and all that it is because something is pressing them
Situations will move people to do what they don't want to do. But they will be forced to do it because of the pressure that is upon them. And many have come to turn to so many things. Nobody receives anything from the devil for free. You get it? He lets you believe that it is free. But by the time that you use it, that is the time he will come and let you know the conditions of what you have used. So where you turn to in time of trouble is very important. In time of trouble, you have to allow God to take over. As children of God, in time of trouble, we have to allow God to take over the situation. Psalm 55 and the verses 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. That difficult moment, whatever that is pressing you, cast your burdens upon the Lord. Cast your burdens upon the Lord and the Lord shall sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. They will not move you because God had established you. And when God has established you, no power will displace you. In only one condition, that whatever that you are going through, you cast that situation upon the Lord. Number two thing that you have to do when you are pressed by the situation in time of discouragement, as you cast your burden upon the Lord, you have to start seeing divine possibilities into your situations. If you are looking unto God, you have to start seeing divine possibilities. Unusual faith. Looking to see God performing signs and wonders in the situation. What is impossible, what men have already written off, God's handwriting can recreate it all. So when you are into the situation and it seems like there is no hope, you need, number one, to cast that burden upon the Lord. And number two, to start seeing divine possibilities. In other words, see that your God is going to do something about your situation. Everything that comes from God is all divine. If it is coming from God, it is all divine. And if you hear the word divine, it means that the one that has all power, the overall saying one and no one, dare to go against it. He is able to turn any situation around. As a man thinketh, so he is. So if only you can integrate within your heart that now that you have cast your burdens upon the Lord, God will sustain you. It is already a step of breakthrough. <clears throat> you must then live in the conscious that every problem that you are facing has an end. If you can see divine possibility, then you, might, you have to be conscious that whatever problem that you are going through, it has an end. Because your God will sustain you. And he will not suffer you 
to be moved. That is, that is the final of what the Lord God is going to do. So you have to stop thinking that your afflictions and your trials will not end. It is when the enemy comes around and sustains the evil thoughts of people and planted it in their heart, that is the time that they moved to start thinking of committing suicide. Because they cannot see an end of their problems. They cannot see an end of their problems. They cannot see a solution in their problems. So they said that, let me just take my life and everything will end just right there. You have to see divine solution. And if you can see divine solution, automatically, you come to integrate it within your heart that your problem will surely come to an end. You have to believe that every trial that will come on your way, the moment, the moment that your mindset is right, you start seeing miracles. Miracles. You will not see miracle if you don't see divine possibilities. You will not see miracle if you are not seeing divine possibilities. So when you can see that your God who did it for you some time ago he can do it again and again and again and again then you realize that your troubles your sickness your financial embarrassment fear and satanic attack all that can come to an end. That is when you start seeing God as the ultimate you must begin to start seeing divine possibilities divine possibilities the difference between us as children of god and they that are out there that do not have hope is that when they find themselves in the situation of hopeless they have nothing to hang on but we have jesus as the author of our hope so when we are going through situations, when we come to be in a situation of discouragement, we said, no, there is hope. We start seeing God's intervention in our, in our situation. And you have to see it. You have to see it because if you cannot see it, you cannot obtain it. If you cannot see it, you cannot obtain it. See the divine possibility and your miracle. You know, this woman, the, the husband was a prophet and he died. Found herself in debt with the attack of the enemy to come and destitute her of her children. This is more than enough for this woman to also take her life. My husband is gone. My children have been taken away. What is the purpose of my life now? Your husband is gone. Your children are gone. And all these predicaments are coming upon you. And you are sitting down and thinking, what is the purpose of my life? All that I wait for, everything has been taken away now. What is the purpose? What reason do I have today to continue living? God, you have deceived me. And I was deceived. This is the time that the one that have called Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. And the man is going through tough times and coming back. And say, God, you have deceived me. Many are children of God that continuously uttering these words. I follow you and things are hard. I am a Christian and things are not working. 
I am a child of God and why is it that this is coming upon me? I am praying, so why is this thing not taken away from me? Let me tell you this. It is part of our Christian journey. What is killing them? When it comes upon you, it will only strengthen you. It is by the grace of God that a man lives. It is by the grace of God that a man lives. So when these things are thrown as attacks of the enemy against your life, you have to be able to shake yourself. The shaking of yourself is to see in your God that he is able. It's to see in divine possibilities that are coming from your God. It is seeing the problem that it will not be there forever. That one way or another, the Lord God will come in and everything shall turn around. The same way that you are seeing that much sorrow in the night, let me tell you, the morning will come and the joy will surely be coming unto your life. It's a fact. But your acceptance of this fact with our God is so important. She did not run to the world. She did not run to any fetish priest. She did not run to nobody. She saw divine possibility from the man of God and she ran to Elisha. She ran to Elisha. Second Kings 4, chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. When this woman ran to Elisha, Elisha said to her, I understand all that you are telling me, but I wonder how I can be of help. Tell me. Madam, tell me. What do you have in your house? And the woman said nothing. And then she came back to her senses and said, well, I do have a little oil. I do have a little oil in the house. And the man of God said, Woman, here is what you will do. Go up and down the street and bow jacks and bowls from all your neighbors. And not just few. All you can get. Once you have them, what you do, come back home. And lock the door behind you. You and your sons. Then pour the oil into each container. When each is full, you just set it aside. You have to start seeing divine possibilities. Go to the right source and start seeing divine possibilities. The man of God said, said mm, how can I help you? Okay. How can you help her after that she has told you her predicament? How can I be of help? He said, well, this is what you can do. This is the divine possibility that God planted in his prophets. And he uttered the words of God to her. Go to the street. Borrow. Borrow jacks. Borrow bowls. Don't take few. Take as much as you can. Once you have them all, go to your house. Shut down. You know, close the door. You and your children. And start using the little oil that you have in home. Start pouring the oil in these containers that you collected. Each one of them, as soon as it is filled up, put it aside. And continue filling these containers. Hallelujah. You can see divine possibilities. I have come to you and I'm telling you that the issue that we are having here is that we cannot pay this man. And the man is coming to collect my children. And the divine possibility, 
Go to the streets. Borrow. Borrow bowls. Borrow jars. Come and the little oil. You see, when God is bringing forth these possibilities into your life, if you are going to start thinking about how and the when and all the questions that you might have about the word of God that had come to you and how this word is going to perform and solve your problem, you'll be there for a long time. The act of faith has to be released and move on and you will see that the word had triggered something great and you will see that divine possibility being materialized in your life. How can the little oil, the little oil, possibly fill these containers? And not just little containers. He said, don't, don't, don't borrow just small. Borrow a lot, as much as you can. And come and fill it with this little oil that you have left. We know it's little because it was said that it is little. And secondly, the woman herself never seen this oil as a possibility. What you have in your life that you don't consider as something that God can use. Let me tell you, when the Lord God comes to that situation, the Lord God is capable to use anything, turn anything around unto his own glory. We don't limit God. We don't. He's an unlimited God. A God of breakthrough. A God who is on high. As heaven is higher than the earth. So are the possibilities that might come to you. They are completely higher than any thought of any man. He will sustain you at that time. The woman went and went and did exactly as the man of God said. You know, there is a Mark chapter 9 and the verse is 23. The Lord is simply saying that he said Jesus, that was Jesus' statement. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. I don't know how long you have been in this country and things are, you know, maybe things used to be going very well. It comes to a point that the whole situation has been turned around. And at this stage, you are not moving forward. You are not moving backward. It's like everything is stagnant around you. And you will sit down and you can see that people that are looking at you, they are mocking you. They are mocking you. They bring your past glory. And they are using it to mock you. See, look at him now. Look at her now. Let me tell you. It is not over. Until the Lord God says it is over. It is not over until the Lord God says it is over. As far as a man is alive, there is hope. There is hope. Put yourself together. Because with men, many things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So verse 5 to 7 of 2 Kings chapter 4. The woman went and did what the man of God said to her. She locked the door behind her and her sons. And as they brought the containers to her, she filled them. When all the jacks and the bowls were full, she said unto one of her sons, Another jack, please. And the son said, That's it. There is no more jack. Then the oil stopped. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The oil stopped by the time that they said there is no more container. The little oil had now filled containers. And the woman's house now is full of containers, full of oil. Hallelujah. This is to tell you that no man can, nobody, no man can limit God. 
No man can limit God in terms of God's possibilities for your life. The only person that can stop God's possibilities for your life, it is you. You are the only one that can stop God's possibilities in your life. God will not do what a man doesn't want. He does not force himself upon nobody. God is not certain. It's a gentle spirit. And Jesus Christ came at the door. Stayed at the door and continue knocking. If you open, he comes in. If you don't, the day that you open, the Lord will come in. The choice is yours. The oil will only cease by the time that you said, I don't have container anymore. That's the time the oil ceased. After she has done all this, verse 7, she went and told the story to the man of God. And the man of God said this to her. He said, Madam, go sell the oil and make good on your debt. Live both you and your sons on what is left. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give God all the glory. All the honor. This woman who couldn't see any possibility from nowhere. But we thank God. She could run to God through his prophet. Now the woman has become a businesswoman. Hallelujah. She is going to sell this oil. And also, you know, abundance is beyond imagination. The woman had the solution in her house. But she did not, she did not know that the solution was just right there. Let me tell you, you don't need to go to any Baba's house to look for solution. The solution is just right there in your house in the name of Jesus. Just right there in your house. Right there with you. God who created you had already planted so much in you. Your acceptance of who you are will turn your life around. Let them continue mocking you. At this time that this woman now has become the seller of oil for your assistance.